So we use MRI to investigate the pet with epilepsy and determine if their brain has a normal structure. However, seizures can actually cause lesions that you can see on MRI. So how do we distinguish those postictal changes from actual pathology? In this lecture, I'm going to give you some hints and tips, in particularly focusing on how to distinguish postictal changes from limbic encephalitis. So this is the third in a series of three lectures on MRI of epileptic patients. And today we're going to talk about postictal um, changes or are they pathological changes causing the seizures? So here we have an example. This is a two year old bulldog that was presented in status epilepticus um, with focal seizures. Now, some of you may be surprised um, to say that um, this dog is in status epilepticus. And indeed, um, the, uh, the uh, local out of hours clinic actually discharged this dog without any drugs, despite the fact he was in status epilepticus because they didn't recognize that this was continuous seizure activity. Um, uh, the, you may say the dog looks conscious. Well, uh, if it's a focal seizure, then, then some sort of conscious uh, uh, being awake can be preserved. But we obviously don't know what's going on inside the dog's head and whether they're having some abnormal perceptions. Um, and in this dog, um, we can see these changes um, through the temporal lobes here, and in particular the, the hippocampal regions um, uh, that are bilateral and symmetrical. And we also have some changes um, here in this uh, area of the, uh, of the tem lateral temporal lobe. And the question is, in this dog, is this change that is secondary to having the seizures? Um, is this um, a, a, a postictal edema? Or is this the primary disease? Does this dog have an encephalitis through this region, which is often referred to as a limbic encephalitis? Uh, and the plot sort of thickens with this, um, with this dog. Um, he's a bulldog and typically bulldogs have big ventricles. Um, and certainly these are um, big ventricles. So any, um, any brachycephalic breed is, is predisposed to having um, big ventricles. Um, but he also has quite thin temporal lobes here, especially in the in the um, hippocampal area. Um, and these are the areas which are edematous, which we can see coming through here in this parasagittal region and here going right through to the cingulate gyrus and here through the temporal lobe here. And those are the flare images and, and these are taking up contrast as well. Um, uh, so is this temporal lobe atrophy um, due to uh, him having um, uh, big ventricles and being a brachycephalic dog? Or is there some sort of pathology going on? Well, the, the answer is probably that there is some sort of pathology going on and this dog has limbic encephalitis because there's really quite marked contrast uptake. And we wouldn't expect that marked contrast uptake uh, as a postictal effect, although it can sometimes you can get contrast uh, enhancement there. So it's not an absolute. Um, so um, here we have another example. I have to thank uh, um, uh, Anna here for these allowing me to use these images. And this is a cat that she originally saw um, that um, was uh, with suspected limbic encephalitis and there are hippocampal changes in this particular cat. So, cat. so in the T2 weighted images we have a uh, swelling of the mesial temporal load um, and we can also see that change on the flare um, and we can also see contrast uptake. Although it's a little bit confusing in this cat because often with uh, limbic encephalitis we will have bilateral changes and there's a suspicion of some edema in this area, but it's 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 not um, um, uh, um, really realised here. And this is about a one Tesla um, MRI scanner, so it's not the you know it's not the the the, the best quality of images that you can um, that you can get. Um, the the scanner in that place has now been been upgraded, I should say, um, and Anna works somewhere differently. Um, so this is a, an old image in this instance. 
Um, so I then inherited this cat um, after Anna had given it very appropriate treatment for limbic encephalitis, including steroids and anti-epilepsy drugs. And that's a subject of a uh, of the uh, of a f uh, future lecture, uh, how to manage limbic encephalitis. And I inherited the cat uh, after that. Um, and uh, these we repeated the MRI scans because this is 18 months later and the cat has refractory epilepsy. Um, uh, and in this instance, now we can see that there has been some permanent changes caused by the ongoing uh, encephalitis and probably the, the, the seizures. So we have now atrophy of this temporal lobe here um, and we can still see some changes on the flare, but it's not quite as distinct. We can see in comparison to the last image where this, this was very swollen, um, the, the, this is much noticeably reduced in side compared to the normal side. And it's much more obvious on the 3D uh, weighted T1 image. We can see this much more greater area of CSF around this here. And we do not see enhancement uh, with gadolinium now. Here we have a, another example. So again, this cat is not actually known to what was going on. Um, on here and it has a few changes which we wouldn't expect with um, uh, straightforward limbic encephalitis um, because it has other cortical involvement but there's very definitely involvement of the mesial temporal lobe here and here and um, we have this area here which is a complete whiteout so what is going on in this is it completely necrotic um, or is it inflammatory? Um, when we look at the flare, this can help us. So this area here, uh, black area here is the, and white area here is the ventricle. And we can notice that it looks very, very different to the other side. So there's already a significant amount of atrophy going on in this cat. Um, uh, by contrast, this other area is not is showing up with a lot of white signal and we can actually see some changes. So it definitely looks like there's some brain tissue in there, but um, it, it's so black in some areas that then this must be uh, necrotic. And there's a, um, a, a lot of signal on the outside suggesting that there is a, a, a meningeal component. Look at this area here. So we have this, um, these subarachnoid spaces here are really well pronounced in comparison to the other side. And this is likely that there is cortical atrophy here. Um, and we have contrast enhancement um, of the mesotemporal lobes, really quite dramatic. Uh, and we also have leptomeningeal um, contrast enhancement, which is much more uh, on this side compared to the more normal side on this side. Of course, the meninges will enhance with a little bit of contrast because it doesn't have a blood brain barrier. And so how do we interpret this? Well, we definitely have an active ongoing inflammatory process that involves bilaterally the limbic area. So it is sort of limbic encephalitis in that respect, but it does also appear to involve uh, the cortex. This disease's process um, although the, the cat presented in status epilepticus when this was taken, um, the, there must have been things going on beforehand because there is so much necrosis of the brain and um, so much ongoing atrophy. Um, and uh, this ongoing atrophy means that the, the cat has a much poorer prognosis. And indeed, uh, we know this cat remained epileptic and that he had memory loss. You may wonder what memory loss looks like in a cat. Well, um, he needed to be reminded um, uh, 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 when to eat sometimes and uh, he would also get lost uh, outside. So he couldn't he had to remain an indoor cat. He was very easily confused. Um, so um, with this, we have a combination of ongoing inflammatory change and also damage caused by the seizures and the inflammation in that limbic area. This is a rather horrible slide, but I put it up really so that you can take a photograph or a screenshot of it really, because it is quite challenging to distinguish limbic encephalitis on uh, MRI as opposed to um, uh, uh, postictal hippocampal edema and necrosis. So I wanted to pull out and, and there was no 
absolute with this. I just wanted to pull out a few things. Um, with limbic encephalopathy, there is bilateral medial temporal lobe involvement, usually, but not always, as we saw with the case of, of, of Anna. And that will result in T2-weighted or flare hyperintensity. There's often swelling of the temporal lobe, um, and they, it will often, but not always, take up paramagnetic contrast. With postictal hippocampoedema or, or necrosis, a changes after a seizure, um, uh, then again, it can look like bilateral medial temporal lobe um, uh, swelling, but there may be lateral temporal lobe involvement as well. And there's often other cortical involvement. It usually can see be seen spreading along the white matter, usually going up the corpus callosum and the cingulate gyrus, which reflects that seizure transmission along the neuronal networks. And the, the most important way of telling the difference, at least in humans, is that there is increased signal intensity on um, uh, diffusion weighted images and reduced um, ADC at the same location as that T2 hyperintensity. Uh, and you don't get the same change um, necessarily on the limbic encephalopathy. And it's unusual to have the um, paramagnetic limb, uh, um, contrast enhancement actually in the mesial temporal lobe but you may get some leptomangial enhancement that's usually over overlying a focal area uh, of the ictal uh, cortex but most importantly these changes are transient um, now one thing that doesn't exist is knowing when to um, uh, how long these last um, and what if we suspect that the changes are due to post uh, ictal change you know if the animal has been in status epilepticus then what we, what we will often suggest to owners is that they take uh, the opportunity to have a repeat mri scan what's not clear is when to repeat that mri scan um, you can use it on the basis of the neurological exam so if the neurological examination remains normal um, then uh, then there's much less chance of ongoing pathology um, uh, by converse, if the neurological examination changes, then you may want to repeat that MRI and see if anything else has changed. Um, otherwise, I would suggest probably about two weeks, um, um, but you may want to, to do it later uh, for, for reasons that I'm going to show you in the next slide. And finally, we have other pathology. So often that is unilateral, so just affecting one temporal lobe. Um, and they may often have lateral temporal lobes. So if it's a tumour, for example, of inflammation, then it may spread to that lateral temporal lobe. Um, uh, and um, and it will often have paramagnetic contrast involvement. So here is an, another example that I wanted to show you. So this was an English setter that was presented in Status Epilepticus. Uh, it had idiopathic epilepsy. It had Status Epilepticus because um, it... Um, uh, had very bad epilepsy and hadn't been started on treatment promptly enough, um, which is the subject of another lecture. And you can see the edema that's coming up through the temporal lobe hippocampal region, going through the um, uh, corpus callosum, through the um, cingulate gyrus, and right up into the motor cortex and the supplementary motor area. So there's real spread kind of showing you where this seizure is spreading through the neuronal networks in, in, in this. And this seeing this kind of changes is actually one of the reasons why we don't necessarily recommend taking an MRI scan during status epilepticus if we have a high suspicion that the dog has idiopathic epilepsy. It's not unusual for a dog to be referred as an emergency, but with the vet saying, rather than management of the seizures, but saying emergency MRI scan. Well, if you take an emergency MRI scan, then this is what you're going to see, um, which is not necessarily very helpful because it doesn't tell the owner whether or not the dog has idiopathic uh, epilepsy. Much more important to control the, the seizures in that instance. Um, and so this dog was advised to get another MRI scan and they chose to do it several months later. Uh, and the reason for that was because the dog's neurological examination went back to normal, but also to see if, the, if this had done any damage and it had. Um, uh, and you can see that this um, this is a flare image, I should say, flare sagittal. Um, but uh, this is T2 weighted um, and um, 
we can see that there is marked dilatation of the ventricle. And this is not because the dog has hydrocephalus. This is because the brain is lost. And we can see also this very pronounced subarachnoid space uh, in this dog um, and that there is marked thinning of the cortex. And there's not just marked thinning of the cortex. Um, this cerebellum also looked smaller in this dog. Um, uh, and um, there was evidence that the cerebellum had been damaged by this ongoing seizure activity. And there may be slightly thinner uh, of the brainstem. It certainly feels like the brainstem isn't fitting this area quite as, uh, as, quite as well. Um, and so uh, these are all changes which suggest that this dog is not going to be an easy dog to control. And indeed, he wasn't. The next uh, lecture in the epilepsy seizures will be more on limbic encephalitis, um, on the pathogenesis and on the management, uh, and in particular, telling you the story of Moodus. Thank you very much.